Welcome to Benmark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled Introduction to Human Factors Engineering. I'm Kate Klaus, Senior Attorney in Medmark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of Medmark and today's presenter, Alison Strolik, thank you for joining us. Alison is a Senior Research Director in Human Factors Research and Design at Emergo by UL, as well as a co-founder of the Human Factors Research and Design Practice Group. She has spent her entire career applying human factors engineering principles to medical and pharmaceutical product development. She advises clients on how to apply human factors engineering in a manner that meets FDA's and other regulators' expectations, including developing program plans and leading key meetings on various human factors engineering topics with regulators. Allison con contributes to and oversees a wide range of research and evaluation activities and helps manage the team's quality management system. Allison is a co-author of a book titled Usability Testing of Medical Devices, an author of several technical articles, and is an editor for the Human Factors and Healthcare Journal. She frequently delivers conference presentations, leads panels, and presents webinars on various human factors engineering topics. Allison is a certified human factors professional and holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in human factors from Tufts University and Bentley University, respectively. And with that, I am pleased to turn things over to Allison. Thanks so much, Kate, for that lovely introduction, and thanks to Medmark for hosting me today. Um, and of course, thanks for all of you guys for tuning in. Um, so today I'll be talking about um, giving an overview and introduction to human factors engineering, um, what it is in terms of what it means, what's the discipline, when, what are the activities that you're expected to perform in the course of developing medical devices, combination products, IVDs, software as a medical device, and other medical products. Um, and so we can jump into that. And I may be biased as a human factors professional, but I feel like applying human factors is really the key to making sure that your products are safe, effective, and usable, or at least one of the main keys. Let's talk about it that way. Um, and as Kate said, I will try to get to as many questions as I can at the end, so um, please do share those um, throughout the presentation as they pop up. So Kate gave a lovely introduction, um, which covers a lot of this, so I'll just be brief. Um, in short, I've been doing this work for about 20 years now, and I was one of the co-founders of what is now known as Emergo by UL's Human Factors Research and Design Team. Um, and we were initially founded back in 2005 and then acquired by UL in 2012. Um, so I have spent my whole career doing human factors work in the medical space, um, and I have undergraduate and graduate degrees in human factors, which sometimes is quite uh, surprising for folks to hear. Um, and as Kate mentioned, I'm a co-author of a book titled Usability Testing of Medical Devices. And I enjoy these opportunities to tell others about human factors and answer questions and help spread the good word, if you will. Um, so just to give you some context for why I'm here and the experience that, that I have as well as our global team. Um, so I am representing a global team of about 45 full-time team members. We have staff in the US, Europe, um, Japan, we have partners in China, um, and we have colleagues throughout the world who do this work. And our work focuses on a wide range of medical and pharmaceutical products as referenced here. And the work that we do is applying human factors and striving for user interface design throughout the product development life cycle. Um, and so this is just a quick view of the scope of the work that we do, ranging all the way from conducting early stage research, understanding your users and their needs, um, helping to develop and design products that hopefully are safe and effective to use. And then from there, developing products, doing analyses, doing iterative evaluations, um, and also helping our clients to navigate the regulator expectations associated with human factors um, and hopefully leading to successful submissions. And in addition to our consulting work, um, we've developed a tool called OPUS, um, and it stands for the Optimum Product Usability Suite. And essentially, we found a need, you could say we were doing our own user research, that our customers were looking to apply human factors. They may have had internal team members they want to learn human factors, or they want to do some of the work independently instead of engaging a consulting team such as ours. Um, and so this tool is one where there are some free resources, some available for purchase resources, of course, that are include tools, templates, e-learning videos on various key aspects of applying human factors to medical product development. So if any of you called in or listening to the recording or in a space where you're looking to do human factors, looking to learn more and get a head start on some of the work you need to do from a documentation and execution standpoint, you may find this to be a very valuable resource um, for your team. 
Um, so with that, I'll jump into um, some different slides. We'll talk about an introduction to human factors. What is it? Um, I'll talk about specific human factors, um, talk a bit about the regulatory imperative as well. So there are a lot of commercial benefits that you can gain from applying human factors during device development. Um, but there are, in addition to those commercial benefits, there's a regulatory imperative. So the US FDA, as well as others, require companies to perform human factors activities. I'll tell you a bit about what those activities are um, and then wrap up with some key takeaways. So it's a fair amount to cover in an hour. I think we can do it. And my goal is to leave time for some of your questions as well. Um, so what is human factors engineering? Um, it's really this nice, again, coming from me, an interdisciplinary uh, field that's at the intersection of engineering, psychology, and design. Um, and so it's really this nice blend and actually the program where I got my undergraduate degree, Tufts University, has the program that you can approach from either the psychology side through liberal arts or mechanical engineering. And so it's kind of interesting in that you can really weigh toward one of these circles more than the other, depending on your you know, personal strengths and interests. Um, but fu fundamentally, human factors sets out to make sure that there's a good match between people and products. So we wanna make sure that people can use products safely and effectively, and that represents that regulatory imperative that I mentioned. We also wanna make sure that products can be used in a satisfying way, um, because it's really important that if people are satisfied using a product, if they enjoy it, if it's easy enough for them, they're likely to be more compliant, for example, they're likely to avoid the task of setting specific workarounds for, that may not be in line with your instructions as a manufacturer. So there are a lot of benefits to making sure that users' interactions are satisfying in addition to safe and effective. So if you think about how human factors shows up in, in everyday use, um, you might think about the task of, of opening a can, right? So you have a can from the store, you need to open it. This is a tool you could use um, it is a can opener. Um, you know, if I was in person, I would ask by a show of hands, how many people have this product and how many people maybe have a scar on their palm from trying to wrangle that corkscrew while you're holding the handle? Um, and so we see human factors concerns in everyday products. And we also see human factors successes. So while this may be one option to open that, um, open that can, you also might have this option. Um, and there are a lot of kind of obvious benefits that this tool brings to the one on the previous slide. Here are just a couple of those. Um, I do not work for OXO. This is not a sponsored presentation, but I think probably most people on the call here will have something in their home manufactured by this group because it is typically user-centered design. They feel nice in the hand. It fits. Um, there are no open and obvious hazards. So if I go back to the previous slide, sure, you can tuck this corkscrew in, it is kind of on a pivot there, um, but it's still going to be sticking out from underneath the handle as opposed to concealed altogether from view. Um, and this product here has a lot of these nice designs and affordances that protect the user safety and also make it more mechanically comfortable to use and easier to use. So if we're going to, that was about opening a can, let's say you need to measure your blood pressure. Would you rather use this monitor here, this product, which did the job and when we go to the doctor we see a reasonably at least slightly modernized version of this or would you prefer to use something like this um, that is arguably easier to read more user friendly a little bit less intimidating visually um, and so those are some of the things that we think about when it comes to applying human factors to help evolve products um, to be the best they can be from a safety and effectiveness and also um, satisfaction and usability perspective and one question that oftentimes comes up is like, well, what kinds of products do I need to do human factors on, right? Be, can you be more specific? And applying human factors actually applies to any kind of medical product. Um, now, the level of rigor that you take and the approach you take may vary. So I will get into that later in the presentation, but any medical product and actually any product at all, whether it be a website or a coffee machine or I don't know, my microwave, which is a pain to set the time on for no good reason. Um, human factors can be applied to many different products. Also goes by the names of user experience, human computer interaction, you may have heard ergonomics has some overlap. 
Um, but when it comes to medical products, any medical product can benefit from the application of human factors, whether it's a product used in the home, like one of the injection devices or glucose meter shown on the left, a product used in an emergency use scenario, such as this monitor defibrillator in the center, or a super complex product that's used by very highly trained clinicians, such as the surgical robot pictured on the right. And not only does human factors apply to a very wide range of medical devices, but it also needs to apply to the entire user interface. And so when people sometimes think of the term user interface, they oftentimes think of software or the, the GUI, the graphical user interface. But the way that the FDA defines user interface and the way that we think about it is actually related to any user touch point. So on the left, you have a pen injector, you have a lancet that's used to kind of get a, blood, a drop of blood from your skin. Um, we have a blood glucose meter in the middle with some test strips. The pen injector already has a needle attached. Um, you might think, well, that's the product. That's what I'm really testing, or that's what I'm evaluating, or that's what I'm designing to be safe and effective. When in fact, you also need to pay attention to things like the packaging, any kind of labeling or instructions, and also any training that your users might receive prior to using the product. Um, and so when we talk about the product or even the word user interface, you really wanna be thinking about each of these, each of these touch points. Um, so I'll run through now some what I like to call specific human factors. Um, so in terms of you know, human factors and um, what, what we're really thinking about when we think about making that match between users and products, we're thinking about a, a lot of different characteristics and components and attributes, such as those listed here. So we'll start with vision. Um, when it comes to vision, you want to think about your users and what their visual acuities or potential deficits are. So there are a number of different visual impairments that people can experience, whether related to colorblindness or you know, disease implications, for example, diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration, some of which can come from age, some of which can come from other medical conditions. And you want to think about how are those users, what is their, what is their vision like, and how do I need to design my product to accommodate for that? Um, and so here are just some examples, you know, running a screen through a simulator on what that could look like if you've got individuals with these vision impairments. But you also have to think about environmental characteristics. So on the bottom left, I just have glare, right? That's something that any of us can experience if we're using a certain device in a certain lighting um, situation. And you want to think about the end users of these products. Maybe they're lay people, maybe they're clinicians, but also other individuals. So when we think about using products in the home, we have patients, you might call them, whether it's an adult or a child, they're someone who's receiving a therapy or a treatment, but then you also might have a lay person who's supporting them, whether it's a parent or a partner um, who also needs to know how to use products and may have a different profile than your actual end user. And we'll talk about that um, a little later as well. Um, the next factor that I'll mention is hearing. Um, and so you need to be aware of when you're designing sounds or soundscapes that go with a certain device, what frequency level are you using? What volume are you using? Um, and how does that compare with what your user's abilities are? For example, there's a condition called presbycusis, where in particular, sorry to focus in on folks here, but in particular, older males experience this more often than others. Um, there's a high frequency hearing loss over 5,000 Hertz. So if your product is intended to be used by an older population, um, if you have a, an alert tone or some kind of warning over 5,000 Hertz, you, you may, that may not be detectable by your intended users. So thinking about different sounds, um, whether it be kind of reacted, reactions to a hardware interaction, like a click from a button or a sound that's emitted by software, will your users be able to hear that and then respond to it properly? Or are you at risk that someone could actually not hear that sound, miss that signal, and could that have downstream effects related to their health and well-being? Touch is important. There are a number of devices that can impact, I'm sorry, diseases that can impact people's touch, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetic retinopathy, um, neuropathy, excuse me. And so how does that impact individuals' ability to have the appropriate level of sensation needed to detect certain things, to have the visual, the dexterity, excuse me, manual dexterity to make small connections or twist or untwist things? Um, and can people ex express enough force on something to, for example, 
pull a lever or disconnect or um, click something into place if you're, you know, assembling some components. So thinking about individual's touch and also general physical dexterity is also important. We think about size as well. Um, so if you're developing a surgical product, for example, what are the hand sizes you're trying to accommodate? Um, are you looking, are your users mostly males or females? Are they based in the US or other parts of the world where people may have different sizing? Um, and so this is really important when it comes to designing in particular physical elements of that user interface, right? Handles, um, hand pieces, console components, drawers you're opening and closing, um, controls, making sure that you have physical controls that are spaced out adequately so that someone can clearly target and actuate the control they intend to as opposed to um, hitting a neighboring button, for example. And then we also think about memory. There are some products for which it can take a lot to be able to remember what steps I need to perform. Um, and kind of a rule of thumb is seven plus or minus two is the number of things that someone can store in their short-term memory. So are you expecting the user to remember 13 consecutive steps that need to be performed? Or are you presenting the information about your product and you know, whether it's on a screen or through instructions or through other cues in a way that individuals can grasp and digest it and apply it to using the product? Um, so it's really important to think about who are my users, what is their cognitive capacity versus their cognitive load, and how can I help design the product to meet their needs or to accommodate for any deficit they might have. Um, so that was that, that was kind of the intro to human factors piece. So again, feel free to put any questions you have into the chat. We will address them at the end, or if I can see one pop up midway, I'll try to address it in um, you know during the presentation if they're relevant to the slides I'm still on. So I want to go now into the regulatory imperative. Um, and so there's a couple different factors um, here, and I will be sharing some, some specific examples. Um, so regulatory imperative to imply human factors. There's the US FDA, um, which we will speak about their guidance more. And typically the FDA we found has the most rigorous expectations for applying human factors. But there's also international ex expectations. For example, those set forth by IEC 62366, which is an international standard where notified bodies in Europe are looking for compliance with that. Um, and there's also other areas of the world that are now putting out their own human factors um, standards and guidance documents. And one key thing is that human factors must be integrated with overall risk management efforts. Um, and so I'm, I don't know how many of you on the line are directly involved in risk management for your products, but it's something that is related to not only electrical hazards, biocompatibility hazards, but also those that arise during use. So what things could go wrong when someone is using your product and how do you mitigate against those? And then how do you evaluate those uh, mitigations or design features you're putting into place? So I will be speaking briefly about what we call use-related risk analysis, which is really that foundation or bedrock of any human factors program. The other thing is, just like the takeaway point, devices have to be safe and effective. That's what the FDA is looking for. Um, does the US FDA care if products are sufficiently usable? Hopefully they'll care somewhat, um, but really the focus is on the safety and efficacy. Can a product be used as intended? Are people going to be able to use it properly or well enough, or are they gonna be subjecting themselves or the end users to serious harm? Um, so really that safety is where we focus in this medical space as compared to if we were working on human factors for financial technology or a consumer product, as much as I'd love my coffee maker to be more usable, it's wasting some time and maybe some coffee. So it's really not that big of a deal if I, I had messed up and need to start over. All right. Oh, I had an animation failure here. Sorry for that. Focus your eyes, avert your eyes from the right, look at the left. Um, so here I'll get started with the regulatory overview for the US. Um, and on the left here, I'm showing the most pertinent guidance documents set forth by CDRH, which is the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, um, which regulates medical devices in the US. And so this top document here was published as a final guidance in February 2016, um, which is getting up there in age. However, it does still represent the FDA's current thinking um, on human factors. 
Um, and so that is, it's a very easy to use document. It's clear. It's I think only 50 pages or something, has some nice examples. So if you have any responsibility for human factors in your role, highly recommend reviewing this first document I'm showing here if you have not, if you're not already familiar with it. And then the document coming behind it is a draft guidance document that was released in December, 2022. And this draft guidance document tries to provide more clarity to manufacturers or sponsors in terms of what human factors data needs to be submitted to the FDA along with a given submission. Um, and it reflects on things like, is this a brand new product? Are you making design changes to an already marketed and approved product? What is the risk profile? That type of information. And then the other set of documents that we have are produced by CEDAR, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, CDER, that regulates combination products. Um, and so on the left hand, kind of the documents that are oriented vertically, um, the one in the foreground was just finalized last September, kind of interestingly in like a Q&A format, and it finalizes the document that's behind it, which is about basically the nuances of applying human factors specifically to combination products. Then of the three you see on the right here, the upper two, the one that starts comparative analysis and contents of a complete submission for threshold analysis, those are mostly, but not exclusively, but mostly related to proposed generic products. So if you're developing a product that is going through the ANDUA or abbreviated new drug application process, those are relevant in particular for your products. And then the lower right, the one I kind of accidentally previewed earlier, that was just released, um, I believe in July, just a couple months ago. And that focuses more on this pivotal activity of use related risk analysis. So let's go over to Europe for a couple minutes. Um, so the FDA, a lot of, lot of expectations there, guidance document. Um, the draft of FDA's guidance first came out on human factors in 2011. So it's been some time. So when we have, when there are manufacturers who are not aware of the human factors expectations in the US, there's, there's, the FDA has quite rigorous expectations and upholds them and expects them to be met because this guidance has actually been around for quite some time. Now, if we go to Europe, this is the most pertinent document, which is a standard, and that's IEC 62366. And this dash one document, if you can see my mouse there, this dash one document is a standard. It includes all the shall statements in terms of what manufacturers shall do in the course of developing their products from a human factors perspective. Um, and it's pointed to by 60601-1-6. And now the document I just showed on the screen, this dash two document is called a technical report. And it's really a very helpful document. Um, so it presents detailed guidance and some examples on how to perform and document the work that's called for to be able to comply with the part one standard. And this standard is upheld by a wide range of regulatory bodies, um, including in Europe, including the European Medicines Agency or EMA, um, Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA, and notified bodies who assess conformance with products um, with the 60601 standard will need to also check and inspect your, your file for usability engineering data that shows you're complying with this standard. And then while it's not a standard, but a guidance document, I do want to give a quick acknowledgement to this MHRA guidance put out by the regulatory body in the UK that is also about human factors and usability. And when we look at the US versus the international expectations, the good news for manufacturers is there's a lot of overlap. And so what you see here is the FDA circle is larger. It's a, a more rigorous set of expectations, particularly when it comes around to this validation testing, which I'll speak to. And satisfying IEC 62366 is a smaller subset uh, because the expectations are a little bit less specific and less rigorous in some areas. And you can mostly leverage the work you've done for the FDA, use it to comply with IEC 62366. And then on the outside there in that red area are some special documents that have certain titles that require some kind of reorganization and reformatting of the information that you've already prepared for the FDA assuming you're seeking um, approval or clearance for your product in both marketplaces. So the core requirements called for by the IEC standard and FDA guidance are as follows. One is make a plan. Have a plan for incorporating human factors throughout your development effort and make sure that continues and spans your entire development process. 
there are a lot of companies that try to wait till the end. It's not a good idea. We can talk offline about why it's not a good idea, but just trust me, plan on it, get buy-in from your stakeholders, incorporate it with your R&D iterative process. You need to define your intended users, use environments, and the user interface as you develop it. Understand who you're designing for, what the use context is, and then design your user interface or your product and all of its components based on that. We'll talk about use-related risk analysis more in this presentation. That is the foundation of scoping your human factors work and also determining what types of information you need to submit to the FDA um, when you do your pre-submission. And then also validating ultimately that your design can be used safely and effectively and any of these mitigations or risk control measures you put in place are effective. And then of course, document the work. If you didn't document it, it didn't happen. I do want to give a quick acknowledgement to some newer standards that are coming out, specifically in China and Japan. Um, so we find that most of our customers are focused on the FDA and IEC because those guidance and standards documents, respectively, are the most developed, the most highly enforced at this case, and they've been around for the longest. Um, but I do want to share that the Chinese NMPA released the most, um, the most recent version of their human factors document just a few months ago, six months ago in March. So they had a first version. Um, I think in 2020, they revised it in 2022, and then October 2023, and then they got quite a bit of feedback based on some public comment, and so they revised it once more, um, and that's been released most recently in March 2024. And there's, if I was to add them to that Venn diagram, there is a fair amount of overlap in between the FDA and IEC guidance and the NMPA, but there are some specific points for market access in China from a human factors perspective that manufacturers need to be aware of. Um, I can't get into the details in the scope of today's presentation, but do feel free to reach out um, if market access in China or Japan is something you're looking into and you wanna make sure you understand what those specific, um, specific expectations are. Our team has also done blogs and webinars on that guidance in case you wanted to Google search it and, and find those for some more details in, on China in particular. And that's set forth by the NMPA, the National, Medi the National Medical Products Administration in China. And then the other standard I want to mention is put out by the Japanese PMDA, which is the Pharmaceutical and Medical Devices Agency. Um, this is based on IEC 62366, which is that international standard on usability engineering. And at this point, it's, it's pretty similar to that, um, but it's been republished and le leveraged for the Japanese market. Um, and that was initially done in, first released in 2019, revised in 2022. Um, and then there was a grace period that ended April 1st of 2024 in terms of putting that into practice. All right, I know that was a lot, different guidance documents. If you want the slides later, just email me. My email address is at the end. And I think someone may put it into the chat or may have already done so. Um, and you can look further into those. So now that we've gotten kind of the regulatory imperative as our foundation. Um, I wanna go more into this process, what it looks like, what some of the deliverables are. Um, and based on how we're doing on time, we should have um, time for a, a fair number of questions at the end, which will be great. So I listed some of these things earlier in terms of what the process is. So I'll just give you guys a moment to review this slide and then I'll call upon some specific points. All right, so we talked about some of these steps. I am gonna go through um, each of these in a couple minutes each to give you more detail. Um, but this is the overall process. And one thing that I wanna share is that the nice thing about human factors work is it's highly scalable. And so as you're building your human factors plan and building human factors into your development efforts, um, there are different ways that you can you know, increase or decrease the level of work that you're doing. And we typically think about scaling the work based on two factors. One being the product risk profile. So that's on, on the left here, a potential for harmful use errors. And the other is functional complexity. And so if we take a minute to look at this graphic, um, you probably won't be surprised to see that um, you know, a heart-lung perfusion system is in the upper right, and also a surgical robot is in the upper right in terms of high functional complexity and also the potential for harmful use errors. Um, what you might be more surprised to see, maybe, maybe not, as I looked on the left side of this chart, you've got two devices that look the same, 
but one is associated with a low potential for harmful use errors and the other is for a high potential for harmful use errors. And so why that is, is that these products, these injection devices, in this case, they're both pen, multi-dose pen injectors, can contain a wide range of medications. So whereas making sure that you are injecting the proper amount of insulin is very critical in terms of enabling people with diabetes to control blood sugar levels and avoid hyperglycemic and hypoglycemic events, what would be lower on the potential for serious error and harm would be some a pen that includes, for example, that contains growth hormone or, or fertility medication. So of course you still want those products to work effectively, but if someone doesn't get the exact dose of, of a hormone, um, that is not gonna have an immediate and probably not even the long-term effect if it's a single or you know two, two occurrences, then it would be to um, deliver the wrong insulin dose. And then we've plotted out some other products here as well, um, including an endoscope, um, an AED, a home dialysis system, those types of products, a scanner. So you can think about the products that you're developing, where those would be on this, on this graph here, and think about how you would scale your human factors program in terms of the number of design reviews and usability tests you're doing, uh, maybe how many different countries you're doing user research in, et cetera. So how do you go about conducting these activities? We want to start with an understanding of our users and the use environments of a given device. Um, and we split our approach here into a couple of different categories. So on the left, we have hands-on research. Um, and this is for anyone who's in this field or has had the opportunity to do this, super fun, in my opinion, to conduct this kind of research, speak to the users, watch them do their work, and think about how what you've learned from them applies directly and should inform a given product development effort that's in process. So um, these types of activities include observations. Sometimes you hear fancier terms like contextual inquiry or ethnographic research, but really the research we're talking about at this stage is, is pretty fundamental in terms of looking at people, how they're doing their work, listening to them, asking them questions and learning from that. And similarly, interviews or surveys or focus groups can be good examples of opportunities to get that feedback from representative users. And then we also have desktop research. So the internet is an amazing place, sometimes uh, distracting or, or hazardous maybe, but full of information. Um, so we've done web searches, literature reviews through peer reviewed journals, um, looking at company documentation from prior product efforts to make sure that we're understanding our users and our use environments appropriately. And we know who we're designing for and where our product will be used because that context of use is really critical. So in terms of documenting that, um, we oftentimes prepare what's called user profiles. And that IEC 62366-2 document has a really nice outline, which we're kind of leveraging here. Um, but these are the kind of factors you want to consider when you're thinking of who are your users. So you may be developing an infusion pump used in hospital settings, and there may be a couple of different user groups, you know, maybe physicians, maybe nurses, for example. And you want to think about these various things listed on the left. Um, their occupation, their education level, skills, where do they work? What experience do they have with prior devices that may or may not impact how they work with your device? And you would take the same approach as well to um, review and document aspects related to lay users. So you may have older adults or you may have adolescents or children using a product. And similarly, you would want to collect and document this kind of information. And then this serves as a nice reference in the library of sorts for the human factors team and the development team as they're proceeding with development. And this is where you would capture things like, do they have any potential impairments? Are my users expected to have any visual or dexterity or cognitive impairments that we need to know about as we're designing to make sure that our design accommodates their safe and effective use? And then also in terms of taking the same approach, we do this for use environments. So we try to describe a given use environment in terms of lighting and sound and distractions, what other equipment might be in the room? Are there distractions that people might encounter in their normal use environment for this product? Um, what other people are there? And we often try to instantiate this with, with photos as well. So again, this is serving as a baseline, the ongoing reference, and there may already be this type of content somewhere in your design history files, or I guess those files that are later inputs to the official file, either from marketing or clinical or past work that can already be leveraged as a really nice starting point. 
you also need to develop user interface requirements. So once you learn about your users and your needs and their needs, not your needs, you need to consider your needs as well, but here we're really talking about the user's needs, you need to translate those into user interface requirements. Um, and so the key is to think about how, how do we need to design this product? What do our users need to enable the product safely and effectively? What are must-haves? What are nice-to-haves? Um, and on the next slide, we just have some examples of the types of categories you might find your user interface requirements in. Um, so this is setting you up for success in terms of making sure that your learnings from user research are channeling into how you're going about planning your product development effort and scoping what features or functionalities you need to have, um, and then organizing those in terms of like the nature um, of the item. So I mentioned before that use-related risk analysis is really the, the foundation or the bedrock for your human factors activities. And that December 2022 guidance that I mentioned from the FDA calls attention to that in the scope of figuring out on their flow chart what information and data you need to submit to the FDA from a human factors perspective. Um, this flow chart here is not from that guidance. This is from the, the main final guidance. Um, and once you have your user interface requirements in place and you've begun to kind of build out a prototype and think about how the product might be used, you want to perform a task analysis, which means thinking of a task as a use step, plotting out all of the tasks that people need to do with your product, and thinking about what mistakes might happen at each of those steps. So someone might skip a step. Someone might perform a step incorrectly or perform a step out of order. So what problems could occur during the use of your product and which of those could lead to serious harm? So if you're thinking of brainstorming use errors, we can do something called a PCA, perception, cognition, action-based analysis, where we look at each of those tasks or use steps, and then we think about, okay, what could go wrong um, in each of those steps when you're thinking about what users need to perceive, what they need to act on, et cetera. Um, and there are a lot of other approaches you can take to identifying use errors. So we go back to those methods we were using to understand our users and our use environments. Observations, interviews, we'll talk about usability tests in a bit. Um, you can do a web search for what kind of mistakes are happening with similar products or predicate products that are already in the field, and then consider those in your risk analysis. That's what we call known problems analysis. You might have complaint data from post-market surveillance that you can reflect on. And certainly getting together with a multidisciplinary team of individuals um, is also valuable in terms of brainstorming. So I'd started to describe the kind of overall process earlier, um, but basically you're identifying errors, you're thinking about what harms can occur from that error, you're writing the severity of harm, right? So you might have, on a five point scale, you might have negligible, minor, serious, critical, and catastrophic. So let's say you have those five different areas, um, and then you might decide, well, anything above a three or higher, that's what we're concerned about. That's a critical harm, or um, serious, critical, or catastrophic, those items we definitely need to address. So you look at how can we reduce the severity of those occurrences of the harms and or the likelihood of those, those occurrences happening. So you build in some mitigations. I'm gonna to speak to some avenues you can take for that. Mitigations or risk control measures, ideally they're design improvements, and then you wanna evaluate those. Um, so you build in these mitigations, you do a usability test, which is essentially bringing in representative users for a test drive of your product and seeing how they do. Are they able to perform a given task that's associated with harm correctly, safely? Do they make an error that could lead to serious harm? And if yes, is that error acceptable or not? You do an analysis that includes clinical judgment and other factors. Three people in my study made that mistake. Can I live with that? Is that going to be a product that can succeed on the market, avoid serious harm, or do I need to do more to make sure that product is safe and effective? And basically, this is the flow you would take to iterating on your product, making sure the de design can be used safely, and then ideally at the end, you successfully validated your device. A risk analysis can take many forms, um, and our team was actually just presenting yesterday um, to some individuals in the FDA 
um, as one of their experiential learning program agendas. And we talked a bit about risk analysis and what the difference is with different forms. So some of you may be familiar with the use FME, with an FMEA, failure modes and effects analysis. And sometimes there's a use failure modes and effects analysis or UFMEA. And really a risk analysis is similar, um, but the, the FDA puts forth this kind of simplified outline. So um, the FDA does not have a specific format they require but this is something they've recommended in their December 2022 guidance and elsewhere. So just wanted to show you how this kind of comes together. And one of the key factors that we look at and pay attention to is, is something a critical task, yes or no? And a critical task, the FDA defines as any, any step that if performed incorrectly or not performed at all could lead to serious harm. Where serious harm is, in, is um, Serious harm is defined to include compromised medical care. So when we think back to CDRH, the device regulatory group in the FDA versus CDR, the combination product focus group, CDRH is looking for serious harm. So anything rated as a three or higher on this severity rating scale here would be considered a critical task if the severity of harm could be serious, critical, or catastrophic. When it comes to CDR, which focuses on combination products, their definition is a bit different. Their definition does not have the word serious in it. So it says, I don't have these written down right now, but it says, you know, a step that is performed incorrectly or not at all that could lead to harm, which includes, which is defined to include compromised medical care. So it's not just the serious harm. So what that means is that if you have a fertility pen injector and someone's not available, someone's not, um, excuse me, someone is not able to deliver the correct dose, that's not going to lead to serious harm. It'll lead to an unintended outcome, an undesirable outcome of not getting pregnant potentially, but it's not a serious harm to the user. But with the, what CEDAR adds on is compromised medical care related to any harm. And so if there's any instance of a combination product and someone making an error where they're not getting this, the right dose, yes, the FDA will be more concerned about dosing errors when it comes to epinephrine, glucagon, naloxone. These products used to treat um, severe allergies, um, insulin imbalances, and um, opioid overdoses, respectively. However, they will still be concerned if you have users who cannot correctly administer products that are for, for the fertility or hormone related, for example. So we go through, indicate which are critical tasks based on the severity of harm. The FDA when it comes to human factors is focused on severity, they are not asking about, well, how likely is that to happen? If you look at this template, likelihood, probability, it's not even on here. And that's because they feel that it's really challenging for manufacturers to accurately estimate the probability of a certain occurrence. And so they're focused on the severity. If something is affiliated with a high severity of harm, kind of regardless of how often it can happen, they want you to mitigate against that and show that your risk control measures are effective. So what does that mean to mitigate against a problem and how do you do that? So the FDA and the IEC, the FDA guidance and the IEC standard both highlight um, a, this hierarchy essentially for mitigating errors. And the first is inherent safety by design. So an example of this would be you're using connectors that can't be connected to the wrong component that we sometimes call that shape coding. Like if I have two things I need to connect, they only connect to each other and I can't connect them to the wrong tube or the wrong outlet. Next, you have protective measures. So this is physical safety guard, shielded elements, you know, software interlocks, enter a code here kind of situations, confirmation dialogues, those are all protective measures. And at the bottom of the hierarchy is what's called information for safety, which is essentially referring to your instructions, your training, warnings, and as all of you may, may imagine or may have experience with, it's so much easier just to put a label on the outside of your infusion pump than it is to change the software, right? But the FDA knows that this information for safety is oftentimes least effective when it comes to mitigating an issue as compared to design-based mitigations. So that's why this hierarchy is as it is. Changing your labeling should really be a last resort. And there are some products where you don't have a lot of options, right? If you have a, a standard pre-filled syringe that's approved on the market, doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, you may only have your instructions, 
the graphic and printed matter on the packaging, maybe a quick reference guide, et cetera. So I want to talk a little bit about usability testing, and I'm covering a lot during today's presentation in terms of the different methods, which I recognize. And usability testing is one of the more you know, popular or well-known methods, and sometimes people equate human factors with usability testing. So we'll spend a couple minutes on this topic. And usability testing is critical, it's important, and various parts in the development process, but there is more to human factors than usability testing. So maybe that's one of your key takeaways for today, um, which would be great. So um, we talk about two main types of usability tests, formative and then human factors validation or summative. And the way I've always remembered this, well, now I know, of course, the difference. But when I first started out is that formative is when the design is being formed. And so there are a number of different objectives you can use formative testing for. So one is identifying the system or the device strengths and shortcomings. So what is working well for users and, and what is not? Um, you can evaluate design alternatives. So if you're thinking of different, um, different designs for a handle for something or different user interface designs that have different navigations and different menu structures or different controls, formative testing is great for that. You can help determine what training and labeling needs you have to enable people to use your product correctly. Um, you can already get a head start on identifying errors that could occur. And um, I should have said, I, I've been talking about formative usability testing, but let me just take a step back and refer to formative evaluations, as it says on the slide. A formative evaluation is basically anything you do during the development of your product, we are getting feedback on the product as it is, a prototype, for example, and then using that feedback to make iterations and refine the product. So I was just talking about usability testing. That's what's pictured in the bottom right here. This is in our one of our usability labs. On the left, you have the person with the clipboard. They're the moderator. In the background, you have the analyst who's typing notes. And then in the foreground on the right, the gentleman is the usability test participant. So we are watching that person work with a product. We're asking them questions. We're getting feedback. And then that feedback would be fed back into um, to the product development effort. And there, a design review can also count like this in certain ways. And then a cognitive walkthrough, one of these fancy terms that may or may not warrant it. It's basically before you have a real prototype, um, doing a, that, that works that people can interact with, kind of doing a talk through walkthrough of, okay, what would you expect to happen now? And what if this happened? What do you think about that? And that's to get feedback even before you're you know, programming or manufacturing anything. So that's some formative evaluations. And it's intended that you conduct these formative evaluations iteratively throughout your design. So you have something, a prototype, a mock-up, maybe it's a near final product. You get feedback on it and you take that feedback and feed it back into the design and you do that again and again and again. And ideally your product's design is improving and improving and improving. People are having fewer errors or difficulties using it. And then when you arrive um, for your, your human factors validation test, you know you're in good shape. So when you come to a human factors validation test, you're looking for um, to generate data to submit to the FDA or another regulatory body related to showing that your risk mitigations, those risk control measures are effective. And you wanna make sure that participants who are representative users of your product can perform critical tasks safely. Um, and for this product, or as for the formative evaluations, you can have early prototypes, screenshots, printouts if you want, really any kind of mock-up. For the validation study, which is called summative in European guidance and standards, needs to include the production equivalent product. Um, and ideally, in contrast to doing several formative studies, ideally you do one validation study because you've done your homework, you've revised the product design, you're going in confident that that product can be used safely and effectively. So I mentioned earlier, if you don't document it, who's supposed to know you did a good job? Um, and so one of the key things is that the FDA in particular requires what's called an HFE UE summary report. And what's even nicer than being clear about what they want is providing a full page outline for people to follow. So this final guidance released in February, 2016 um, has in appendix A, this outline that I'm showing on the right side of the screen here. It is extremely detailed. It's an eight section report. They are kind enough to give you the bullet points of the key information they want to see in each section. We always use this outline because if there's something that is provided to you in black and white like this, leverage it. 
I will say that the December 2022 guidance has a slightly reorganized version of this, but because it is draft guidance, our team typically still uses this same outline. And even nicer than giving you this outline, if you look at the top here in section one, there's actually a little bit of a Mad Lib to fill in. The device has been found safe and effective for use for the intended users, uses, and use environments. And that's really the claim that you are making as a manufacturer to the FDA. And that HFVUE report tells the story of how you've developed your product, describes your intended users and use environment and uses, describes your product, all of that formative evaluation work you did. The FDA wants to see, what did you find out? What did you change about the device by applying human factors? You talk about your risk profile and critical tasks, and then you kind of end your story with what is hopefully a supportive HF validation test. Um, and this is the sentence they want you to be able to make at the start of your report. So we've talked a lot today about the human factors process and activities and, you know, talk quite a bit about the regulatory imperative, but I want to come back to the commercial benefits of human factors, because even if you have a product that has a low risk profile or it's already on the market, there is still a lot to be gained from taking a user-centered approach to learning about your users and then designing for them um, rather than designing in a vacuum. Um, and there are studies that have been done that show a pretty high cost, excuse me, pretty high benefit to cost ratio when it comes to applying human factors and what that means for your products and its commercial success. So you have improved sales, um, lower rework, lesser chance of um, recalls, for example. Your users are more satisfied. That's nice because some medical products, we don't have a choice what we get to use. Um, but for others, if it's a consumer product used at home, for example, I can choose which glucose meter I want to use. And if I have another friend with that has diabetes and uses a glucose meter, and they find theirs to be easy to use, compact, um, discreet, why wouldn't I take the recommendation and try that one instead of pick a random one off the shelf? Some people view human factors as, oh, one more thing that's that you know I don't have time for, it slows up the development process. And that's actually the wrong, the wrong attitude. Um, if you plan for human factors early, it actually will enable you to get to market faster because you will have caught any issues with your design early, tested it in the hands of users, and been on a great path to having that product be safe and effective. Your training can be simpler. So for some products, training is required. Um, so you can simplify that if the product speaks for itself positively in terms of its ease of use, you know, simplicity, et cetera, and then reduce liability. If you have fewer use errors or use difficulties, there's a lesser chance that you're gonna have adverse events and potential recalls once your product is on the market. So last slide for today, um, we recommend that our customers create human factor standard operating procedures, or at least you know, work instructions that can guide the work so that human factors can be a planful part of your product development effort. It can be incorporated with other R&D activities and there's an understanding for this is where you're going to invest in your future success, both in terms of regulatory success, but also commercial benefits. Um, if you're looking to market your product in various parts of the world, start off by developing a global strategy. So we work with a lot of our customers to say, okay, where do you want market access? Let's look at the requirements for human factors in these different regions and figure out what's the most effective, cost-effective and time-effective way to get the work done. Um, educate the workforce, share a link to this webinar if this is something that would be of interest to team members. Um, we also, also do workshops, you know, private workshops and um, training events to help increase the level of human factors knowledge. And our Opus platform also has some e-learning trainings that are super accessible, 30 to 45 minutes each and give a good baseline, but empower people with information about human factors and how it can benefit them. Um, plan for it, time and money. It will help you later, I promise perform and develop a very robust use-related risk analysis. This is a non-negotiable. Um, it's really critical, serves as the foundation for your human factors work and enables regulators to better understand um, the risk profile of your product. And then conduct at least two, ideally more usability tests in the formative stage as you're iterating your product. The number of tests can really vary widely um, and make sure you're having this library of human factors deliverable. So you have good documentation of the work and then you can leverage those as well for future activities and submissions. 
So with that, I'm happy to take um, whatever questions have come through. And I'll actually just go one more slide while we answer the questions. If you are interested in this presentation, please um, feel free to email me directly. My email address is here. If you have follow-up questions on human factors specific to your development effort that either we didn't get to today or you didn't think of until we um, ended this event, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And thank you again for the opportunity. Allison, thank you so much. This was a lot of information that will be very valuable for the audience. <laughs> no, it's excellent. Uh, we did have a question come in, and I think this might be a concern that applies to a lot of companies. It's about um, the various requirements uh, for conducting risk analyses and how they might duplicate efforts in some ways. So this person is asking, uh, how do you recommend integrating URA and ISO 14971? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, what we typically see companies do is develop a, a broad-based FMEA um, that includes various elements of you know, electrical safety, biocompatibility, usability, um, and take them then kind of exerting, taking out those use related risks and pulling them into a separate document because the FDA sometimes likes to see that, like the template I shared. Um, but you can also keep things in a single risk management file as long as you're identifying what type of risk it is so that human factors professionals looking to plan your human factors activities and identify critical tasks can filter and focus on the use related elements. Um, like I said, you don't have to follow that FDA template that's just an option. Um, but I, I didn't mention 14971 because it's not human factor specific, but it's of course something our team knows a lot about and is critical in terms of the broader risk management. So very good question. The, the, in summary, it's more having the content that's critical versus the format. So you wanna make sure those use related risks are easily distinguishable um, from other use related, from other product risks and hazards. Thank you. Uh, one other question that came in, this uh, I think is more a best practices question. They're asking if a product seems to be very common sense, very straightforward to use, is it enough to videotape a demonstration uh, to prove that you have tested the human factors? Um, so, I'm not quite understanding what, what that means in terms of the video presentation. Um, the, the FDA at least does expect, if you have critical tasks associated with use of your product, so use of your product can lead to some use related risk, um, the FDA does expect you to, to conduct a validation test with representative end users and have people interact with the product. Um, we would normally video record those activities, but that's still, a usability test that needs to be conducted. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. So I'm not sure I fully understood the question. So I welcome someone to follow up with me if they'd like to on that item. But generally, if you have a product with critical tasks, meaning those highly rated risks, you will need to conduct some type of human factors testing. I think that is a great answer to the question. Okay. Um, looking at, uh, I think they were trying to compare the need for usability testing versus just a videotape of a demonstration of the use of the product. Oh yeah, so in, in your submission, you would provide the FDA with, if you have a video, that's great, or you're labeling your instructions, um, but the FDA would still require human factors data from usability testing if your product has the potential for critical tasks, even if it seems intuitive, well-designed, kind of foolproof. I mean, the FDA has asked us to conduct 30 or 60 or 100 person usability tests of a pre-filled syringe or a single use auto injector, which you would think, well, that's pretty simple. Everyone knows how to use this product, right? Um, so you you would need um, actual user study data. Thank you so much. And we are coming up on the hour. Allison, this has been a great presentation. It's really Thanks. valuable information for our audience. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.